Well, we are going to start a, a series over the next uh, probably five or six weeks, uh, maybe, maybe through uh, the end of October, and uh, we'll just see how, how deep and how far God calls us to go through this series. But after talking this last month or so about the, the different doctrinal issues and primary, secondary, and tertiary, and all those various things that make different denominations, who they are in the belief system. I felt that it was kind of important that, that we as Northside take a step back and we kind of look at the things that, that, that we as a church, that our denomination, that, that our faith, what we believe in, what are the core principles and the things that, that we would say as, as, as Christians, as, as Bible-believing, born-again believers in Christ, what are the things that we look to and that we believe in as, as, as core? What's up, Luke? You lost, buddy? He's wondering. <laughs> You're Luke. <laughs> Dallas was pointing and laughing. I thought at me at first, but that's, it's, I guess it was Luke. So it's... <laughs> oh, he could have come up here and preached with me, Brittany. I'd have been all right with it. It's okay. But... Those things, those things that we hold most firm to. Um, the best way to correlate this idea, and, and, and we use a lot of symbolism uh, when I preach and, and, and tactile type things, the best that I could come up with was this concept of an anchor. And anchors are, are something that they're almost as widely recognized as the cross itself. And, and you see a picture of an anchor in your mind immediately, you know exactly what it is, and, and you go straight to it. And, and um, there's a lot of different anchors out there, and we'll talk about that in just a second, but what does an anchor actually do? Well, it's, it's on ships and boats, and, and, and it's the thing that you drop off the side or the front or the back of the ship into the water, and you hope that it keeps you where you're at. That's kind of the, the, the baseline understanding of what an anchor is used for, and, and it does this by a very interesting concept, and, and, and if you look at anchors that are made in, in present day, like 2016, there's, there's some pretty cool looking anchors out there, they all still kind of, sort of, resemble each other. Even some of the brand new ones. Now, they're, they're made just a little bit different, different materials, uh, there's different aerodynamics involved, and there's different, different fundamentals on, on, on how exactly they do what they do, but the main idea is... When the anchor hits the water and it goes down to the bottom and it hits with the ocean floor, the idea is that as the anchor begins to get drug across the ocean floor, the point or points or something on the anchor begins to dig into the sand. And the idea is the harder the chain is pulled or the rope or whatever it is that's attached to the anchor, the harder the boat pulls the deeper the anchor digs into the ground. It's pretty amazing. Now, there's, there's old anchors, there's new anchors, there's small anchors, there's big anchors. You can see that picture. It's kind of hard to make out. The orange blob on the one piece of that anchor is a guy cleaning it. It's a pretty, it's a pretty good size anchor. But there's something about the anchor... It's not just a big weight. It's not just something heavy that you throw in. It's supposed to to work for you. It's supposed to do something. But in order for the anchor to work right, the sailor has to know the conditions of the sea. There's a few things they kind of need to know in order to make sure that that the anchor does what it's supposed to do. They, 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 they roughly, within a, some sort of a margin, need to know about how deep the water is that they're in. Close. They need to kind of know what they're dealing with and what they're working with. Because if you drop an anchor in the open ocean and it doesn't make contact with anything, it's not really doing anything. You're not anchored to anything. You need to know how much slack needs to be in the rope or the chain or whatever it is that's connected to the anchor because it's got to have room to work. There are a number 
of variables that take place when it comes to to setting the anchor. And there's one thing that we have to keep in mind, one very, very, very important aspect about setting an anchor. Dropping the anchor is not enough. It's not enough just to put it in the water. Without movement from the boat, the anchor will not be set. I want you to hang on to that. Because over the course of the next few weeks or however long we go with this series, that's going to be, that's going to be fundamental to what we're talking about. The boat has to move initially in order for the anchor to be set. And so this morning we're starting our series entitled The Anchor of God's Word. And we're going to look at, at what it is that, that, that we as Christians, the very things that we cling to, the very things that we are anchored to in our faith. And as I said before, we, we talked about some of the primary doctrinal issues and, and, and the core belief system of what different denominations believe. And so in the next few weeks, we're going to look at, at what some of those primary beliefs are for us and why we believe them. The reality is uh, these, these core beliefs, these primary doctrinal issues that we believe these aren't just things from God's word that we say, yeah, we, we believe those. These are the things that we live by. These are the beliefs that we would be willing to die for. And so I hope that as, as we study, I hope that, that, that each week we leave here and, 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 and understanding that, yeah, hey, this is probably stuff most of us already knew or should have already have known or should have said, hey, yeah, I'm 100% with that, but... Sometimes we need reminded why we believe what we believe. Sometimes we need affirmation in the things that we believe. Sometimes, if our anchor isn't set right, we can drift. So turn with me, if you would, to the book of Romans. We're going to be in chapter, chapter 1 this morning. Now, the book of Romans has always carried this, this stigma of being a very, very legalistic book. The fact is that um, this particular book is one of the greatest tools that we as believers in Christ have in understanding the foundation of what those beliefs are. They're spelled out very clearly, very cleanly, very, very concise. It explains the good news of salvation that we have through a belief and a trust in Jesus Christ. This book is, of course, written by the Apostle Paul. Many say that it's, it's, it's his greatest work. And as we've been talking on Wednesday nights, if, if, if you've been coming and joining us, we've been going through the book of 1 Timothy, and, and, and we, we, we know that, um, that Paul was about the best example on the face of the earth that could be used to, to explain this grace and mercy, this new beginning that comes from a faith in the Lord. As, as Paul says in 1 Timothy, he was the worst of sinners. Despicable, detestable. The book was written around uh, 57 AD, and it's written to mostly the Gentile believers who were living uh, around the capital city of the Roman Empire. Paul's whole point in, in writing this, like we said, somewhat legalistic book was to give an undisputable, undeniable account of, of clarity over what it means for salvation, for faith, for grace, mercy, all of these things for the believer in Christ. So there would be no confusion, no more arguments, but he wanted to make it super, super clear. So with that being said, stand with me this morning as we read. From the book of Romans, chapter 1, verses 16 and following. It says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall be saved by faith. 
For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For His invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him. But they came, became futile in their thinking. And their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore God gave them up in their lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie. And worshipped the served, worship and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. Lord, we pray as we begin this series on understanding what it means to be anchored to your word. Lord, I pray that you'll give us clarity, Lord, that you'll give us discernment. And God, that we would understand who we are in you. Lord, we thank you for this morning, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. So Paul gives us much theological exposition in in, in ten ten very concise verses as, as we read that little section. He talks about what it means for the sinner to come to know Christ through faith and and to then live by that faith. He then goes on to explain the truths about creation, who God is, and what it means for those of us who walk the face of this earth. He says that we should look for and that we should seek after God because we can see his fingerprints on everything, on everyone. This is the the faith that he talks about in verse 17. And then something something odd happens. As as we read through this pericope of Scripture, we find that Paul takes this dark turn and what he's explaining and how these things are playing out. And, And he says that because men did not seek after him, and instead they they chose to worship the creature. Instead of the Creator, God gave them over to the lusts of their hearts. That's interesting. God gave them over to those things that they desired above Him. The impurities, the dishonoring of their bodies. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie. It's because of these things, it's because of these sins that God's wrath came down upon the sinner. And it's because of this wrath that many, many people in our world today would say and are saying, and if you haven't heard someone say it, you will hear someone say it, that's not fair! How can a loving God condemn people? Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm, I'm here to tell you this morning that it's anything but unfair. God is justified in how he deals with the sin and the lack of righteousness that he sees in the hearts of mankind. This morning we're going to talk about why he is justified in this area. And and the reality is that that, that we as believers not only believe these truths, but we live, as I said before, possibly die by these truths. We better understand what it is that we're standing for. Or else when the day comes, we may not stand. Let 
This morning, God is justified in condemning the sinner for two reasons. Number one, God has revealed himself to everyone. God has revealed himself to everyone. Verse 19, for what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. These are some pretty bold words from Paul. Their meaning has great, great significance for what it means for us as mankind. Why is that? Because we're without excuse. Mankind doesn't have an excuse as to why we can say why we're here, why, why, why anything is here. Someone, someone had to create the things that we see around us. Someone had to have made all that we see. Now, if you talk to, to many atheists, you talk to evolutionists, they would have you believe that the universe was created by this cosmic dust, this stuff that was just floating around, and, and somehow this stuff hit other stuff hard enough that it made this explosion of bigger stuff, and then somehow in the middle of that big explosion of stuff, the earth was created, Okay. And then over the course of a few kabillion, kajillion years, as many evolutionists will tell you, this stuff that was kind of on the earth, this dust somehow melted and merged and formed and came together and produced living cells from nothing, those cells then merged to create life. And the next thing we know, we're watching Cowboy Curtis on Saturday morning cartoons, right? It all makes sense, right? Sounds a bit crazy, if you ask me. Paul and the early church, they didn't have the, the, the so-called science that we do today. And I'm not saying that, that, that science is, is bad or wrong or anything. I think a lot can be learned and, 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 and can teach us a lot. But they didn't have some of these theories and the so-called creative scientific thought that, that we do today. But Paul is basically telling the believers in Rome this. He's saying, look around you. Where did all of this come from? Where did you come from? We're not here by accident. We're not here by chance. We are here because we were created by a living, loving, righteous God. We were put on this planet for a purpose and a calling to have fellowship with Him. Because of this, we are without excuse. God, through simply being who He is and doing what He does, has revealed Himself through His work. You, me, the pew you're sitting on, the air that you're breathing, it was all made by a Creator. It's because of this this truth, this revelation that God calls us to seek after Him. He gives us the opportunity to, to worship Him. However, as we have seen since the beginning of time, mankind chose other things. For whatever reason, God has not been enough for mankind. 
We've lusted after other things, worldly things. We've sought other gods. And it's because of this, it's because of this that we see the second reason why God is justified in condemning the sinner. Number two, God gave everyone over to their sin. Verse 21, for although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie. And they worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. What was that lie? It's as old as the Garden of Eden itself. It's as old as time itself. You don't need God. Who says God is this great being? You can do better on your own. Those are lies. Straight, straight from the serpent himself. These are lies that put human beings in bondage. A bondage that would take the sacrificial love of the very God that we betrayed to save us. You can't write movie scripts this good. The human condition that we find ourselves in today, born into a broken system, born into sin, living a life of sin until we seek the Creator and ask forgiveness of our sins and and receive the grace and, 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 and join Him in a relationship, that human condition that we exist in today is a product of our own doing. God created us for love, for fellowship, and for a relationship with Him. But we, we chose other things. So he handed us over to those other things. God gave mankind the option to choose him or not to choose him. You remember the old game shows? It's behind door number one, door number two, or door number three. We chose the wrong door. It's because of this original sin. that we find ourselves handed over to that sin. God is not a God of bondage. He allows us to choose what we're going to do with our lives. He allows us to either serve Him or serve ourselves. God shows mercy and He grants salvation to those who seek after them, to those that do not seek out after him, he condemns. Some may say, well, aren't there big sinners and then small sinners, and some people are a whole lot worse than other people, and murderers, and and kidnappers, and Versus somebody that maybe just tells a little white lie or somebody that cheats just a little bit or does just a little thing wrong. Condemnation? All sin will condemn you. God says, I'll give you a choice. You can choose. However, there will be consequences of your choice. As we're going to see in the coming weeks, as as we get into this series, we're going to see why those choices 
condemn us. We're going to see what happens in that sin. And Paul is going to explain to us how we can escape the impending condemnation that is due to us. I'm going to ask Josh to come up and get ready with with the praise team for, for our time of invitation this morning, but... You know, we've been talking about this idea of, of, of the anchor and the sailor. And just like a sailor, just like the people who know the seas, and they have to know the condition of the seas, as a Christian, as a human being, we have to know the conditions and what actions we must take. What is that human condition again? For the human race is that we have all fallen short of the glory of God. Because of this, there is a price to be paid. This morning, please don't let this word fall on deaf ears. Please, please hear the words that that I'm saying becoming a Christian there's 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 so much similarity to this idea of of dropping an anchor versus setting an anchor and so many of us so many people we've known throughout the years have have come to church and they've they've believed in God but they have never set the anchor. To be a born-again believer in Christ, to be a Christian, you have to set the anchor. How do you do that? Well, you admit that you're a sinner. You realize that you need forgiveness of those sins. You believe And Jesus Christ, that he died to forgive you of those sins. And you confess those sins to him. And here, here's the most important part of all of that process. And you guys have heard the ABCs all of your life. In order to set the anchor, the boat has to move. In order for a Christian... In order for a human being to become a Christian, you have to set the anchor. You have to repent of those sins. Then, and and only then, will the anchor be set. So when the storms of life come your way and begin to rock your ship back and forth, you will not be moved. My prayer this morning, my hope this morning, is that if there are any in this room that have never truly set that anchor, that you would do that today. Maybe you're being tossed around in in some pretty rough seas. Maybe you don't understand why why sometimes going to church just isn't enough. You have to admit. You have to believe. You have to confess. You have to repent. And when you do, that anchor will be set firmly. You won't have to worry about it anymore. Jesus Christ will be in your heart. The Holy Spirit will begin to work in you. And a new creation will emerge. Stand with me this morning as we have our time of invitation. If the Lord has has spoken to your heart on on this, I I encourage you to come forward and and pray and talk with Him. If there's other things you've been dealing with or struggling with this week, I, I pray that you would come down and talk with the Lord. If you're looking for a church home, I would love to talk with you. Whatever the case may be, Respond to the Holy Spirit this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our time together. Lord, for our worship together. 
God, you have called us to follow you, Lord, to seek after you. And God, to do that, Lord, we have to believe in you and trust in you, Lord. Ask forgiveness of our sins and repent. And by doing so, Heavenly Father, that anchor will be set. Lord, be with us now in our time of invitation. We ask these things in Jesus' name.